Yeah, okay, so uh, hi everybody. Um, so uh, first, of, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you for the organizers for putting together this nice uh, session. And of course, uh, thanks to all of you for showing up. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to talk about uh, revealing dynamical universality using neural quantum states. Um, and uh, the, the point here, or where machine learning comes into play, is uh, what we want to do is uh, simulations of non-equilibrium situations in uh, quantum matter. And as we heard already before, simulating quantum matter uh, per se is a, is a difficult task. Uh, and uh, there are ideas, uh, thanks to Giuseppe, who is also here, uh, how, how some uh, um, ideas from deep learning can, can help us to uh, get a bit further there. Um, you see down here, uh, this is a collaboration uh, of a couple of people. Um, uh, that's Markus Heil, he's now in Augsburg, uh, Marek Grams and Jacek Jamaga, they are in Krakow, uh, and Wojciech Zurek uh, at Los Alamos Lab. So let me start by a very uh, superficial picture of the physical uh, situation that we're interested in. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, composite quantum systems that, co uh, that consist of uh, individual degrees of freedom that are these uh, little spins here. And then as you can see here, they can to take two uh, different states each uh, and uh, they interact in such a fashion that uh, well, there's an external control parameter. And if this control parameter is very small, then they like to align. And then the typical configurations, the classical picture that, that we uh, can, can imagine of that is that, uh, that all of these spins align in the same direction. But then as we uh, increase this control parameter, uh, we are getting to a different situation where, uh, where the, the typical states are very disordered and uh, these the spins point into random directions. And then uh, interestingly, uh, one can identify one uh, individual uh, critical point where the behavior basically uh, changes from this type of behavior to, to the other side. Uh, and that is a phase transition. Um, what I want to look at here is the situation that we initialize the system very deep uh, in this paramagnetic phase, and then we tune this external control parameter in a dynamical way across uh, the phase transition. Uh, and in that way, uh, we will not end up in such a perfect uh, ferromagnet, but we will necessarily uh, create excitations if this uh, ramp is fast enough. And uh, the kind of the question we want to ask is, when we create such excitations, which are uh, basically these domain walls, uh, what is the typical size uh, of the domains that we are creating? Um, a bit more uh, concretely, we are going to look at a, a quantum magnet. Uh, this is a very simple quantum magnet where uh, we have two uh, different terms in the Hamiltonian. On the one hand, we have this easing coupling that gives us uh, the, the ferromagnetic behavior. And on the other side, we have a coupling to a transverse magnetic field which induces uh, quantum fluctuations uh, and this external parameter that I talked about before is this uh, transverse field. And then as I said, we want to tune this external uh, magnetic field across the phase transition. Uh, and I wanna emphasize this is at zero temperature. So this is what we're talking about is a quantum phase transition. And uh, the question uh, that I sketched already before has uh, actually been asked long time ago already. Uh, and that is what characterizes these excitations when this uh, protocol that we are using here uh, is faster than adiabatic such that we create excitations. Um, a, a physical picture that uh, gives an idea of what we can expect uh, yeah, is something that we can gain by looking at uh, or considering how the correlation length will behave in, uh, of the state that we are creating. Uh, and. Uh, I'm showing a cartoon of this down here, um, where on the x-axis we have time, and uh, time basically uh, corresponds here to the value of, of our control field, uh, and we, we are, the, the, the axis is so chosen such that we are crossing the critical point at uh, time zero. And uh, what we know is that uh, as we approach the critical point, the instantaneous ground state correlation length uh, will uh, diverge. Um, also, we know that far away from the critical point, uh, if you think about our time-dependent protocol, uh, it will still be adiabatic, which means that our time-evolved state follows uh, this instantaneous uh, uh, ground state correlation length. Uh, but then at some point, um, it necessarily has to decouple 
And the reason for that is that uh, this uh, system that we are interested in has only this, uh, this local interaction, and that means that there is a speed limit for the spreading of correlations in such systems. And since the uh, ground state correlation length diverges here, we, we hit at some point the speed li limit and cannot keep up anymore uh, with this spreading of correlations. Uh, and this point where the two decouple uh, mark uh, characteristic time scale, which is this uh, time t hat, uh, and also a characteristic, at the same time, characteristic length scale, which is the correlation length uh, at that time. And then when you uh, go a bit into these uh, scaling laws, you can actually uh, uh, derive that these characteristic time and length scales um, only depend on the speed of our protocol, which is this, uh, this uh, variable tau q, uh, and the critical exponents of the underlying quantum phase transition. And this is kind of remarkable because uh, we are here looking at a non-equilibrium situation, but it is fully characterized uh, by the critical exponents of the underlying equilibrium phase transition. And the existence of such, uh, uh, of such characteristic scales um, leads to a non-equilibrium scaling hypothesis, and that is we expect uh, that uh, in, this, in this setting, any uh, observable that is a function of space and time can be expressed in this scaling form where we have this universal scaling functions and the space and time variables um, only enter in proportion to the characteristic uh, time and length scales. Uh, I include here also the system size as a typical additional scale because we're looking at, we're going to look at uh, finite size systems where we can check also for this finite size scaling behavior. Now, uh, this is uh, per se interesting from a theoretical perspective, but uh, moreover, uh, it is very exciting these days that uh, these uh, simple model Hamiltonians uh, can actually be realized in, in experiments of highly controlled quantum systems uh, they are built on quantum optical principles, and one example are these Rydberg atom arrays. Uh, they consist of individual Rydberg atoms, which are held in their position by optical tweezers, so these green dots are individual atoms. And uh, for these purposes, we can view these atoms as two-level systems, where we have uh, uh, the ground state on the one hand, and then a highly excited uh, Rydberg, Rydberg state, and the transition between the two is driven by an external uh, laser, uh, and this kind of Bravi driving gives us, uh, in our simple Hamiltonian, the transverse field term. And on top of that, um, two uh, close-by uh, atoms interact whenever both of them are in this highly excited states because these Rydberg states have large orbitals. So when you excite two close-by atoms to the, uh, to the Rydberg state, then they feel an interaction. And this is actually uh, given by this easing type interaction. So uh, this, this is pretty cool. So one can realize exactly this Hamiltonian in, in those experiments. Uh, and what is even more exciting about these experiments is that you, have, uh, uh, you can observe them with hi very high precision. Um, uh, here, what you're seeing here is actually a photo that was taken in Harvard uh, of such a Rydberg atom array. Uh, and this is an anti-ferromagnetic co uh, configuration of these atoms where you see these small dots. These are the atoms that you see on the photo and the red circles mark positions of atoms that you do not see, that you do not see on the photo uh, because uh, they are in the, in the other state. So in this picture you see, I think the, you see the atoms that are in the ground state and you don't see those that are in the excited state. Uh, so you have this individual atom resolution and uh, even more, uh, you can make these me uh, uh, measurements in a time dependent uh, manner. So here, this is uh, exactly such one protocol where, they, where uh, this axis uh, is a time axis, and on the y-axis we have the correlation length, and they uh, conducted this protocol for different uh, speed of the protocol, and then you see the slower this protocol is, uh, the, the larger is the correlation length that is created in the, in the resulting state, uh, which is consistent with the expectation that when you go slow, then you can create these ordered states which have a long correlation length. Um, okay, so this, this is the experimental realization of uh, that protocol, uh, and what I want to talk about is a numerical realization. So um, we are in the framework of uh, isolated quantum systems, uh, and that means uh, the dynamics is prescribed by uh, yeah, the Schrodinger uh, equation, and what we want to do is to find a numerical solution to this uh, differential equation. Um, and um, yeah, so as we heard before, that's a challenging endeavor. 
uh, but uh, the neuroquantum states can help us get somewhere at least. Uh, for the rest of uh, my talk, uh, I'm planning first to uh, discuss the numerical machinery that is behind all of this, that's the time-dependent variation of principle. Uh, then I'm going to uh, discuss uh, neuroquantum states, uh, which are this uh, deep learning ingredient to the story. And then finally, I'm going to discuss the results that we could achieve. So, um, this, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a wave function based approach. Uh, so ideally, we would be able to write down the full wave function of such a quantum system. Um, and uh, according to the laws of quantum mechanics, uh, this is a, a vector in a Hilbert space, and the basis states of this composite system are given by such uh, tensor products. Uh, and then in order to write down the wave function, we would need to uh, write down all these individual co coefficients, uh, so one complex number for each possible uh, combination of uh, the local states. This structure is very exciting uh, because this is the ingredient which gives us entanglement and thereby uh, features uh, of such quantum systems that we would not have in a, qu in a classical system. But uh, the price uh, of this is this quantum curse of dimensionality, which is that we have to somehow treat uh, a Hilbert space that grows exponentially with the size of the system. Um, yeah, so uh, a naive approach, of course, could be to write down all these complex numbers, but then you quickly exhaust the memory of, of your uh, supercomputer. Um, Luckily, uh, there is some uh, structure that, that one can exploit. Uh, and uh, to, to give a sketch of this here, this is a cartoon of a diagram where we imagine that we organize all these wave functions that exist in a way that we have the weakly entangled uh, wave functions in this corner of, of this cartoon of the Hilbert space. Uh, and then we have strongly entangled wave functions uh, somewhere out here. And then one thing we, that we know is that uh, the ground states of, of one-dimensional quantum systems, they all sit uh, in this weakly entangled uh, corner of the Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, this is a fact that one can expo exploit also in numerical techniques, uh, namely using so-called tensor networks. So for the mathematicians, this is a tensor train. Um, and uh, it is known that these uh, tensor networks, uh, in these tensor networks, basically the, uh, the amount of entanglement uh, corresponds to this dimension of these internal lags that you have in, in this diagram. So if you crank up this, these lags, then you can encode more entanglement. In particular, this means that this is a, an efficient way to write down wave functions in this weakly entangled corner of the Hilbert space. Unfortunately, these uh, non-equilibrium processes that I'm interested in, well, they, they typically start in this weakly entangled corner because those are states that we can prepare. Uh, but then they quickly drive the system towards the highly entangled uh, uh, part of the Hilbert space. And then when we try to, to simulate such dynamics using tensor networks, uh, we eventually hit what we call this entanglement barrier. And this is the point where uh, entanglement becomes so large that uh, one cannot any more efficiently uh, represent the wave function in this tensor network form. Nonetheless, these tensor networks are today uh, the state of the art for simulations in low dimensional systems. And when I say low dimensional, I mean the one dimensional end of this <laughs> line. Uh, you can extend it to 2D, but it becomes very challenging very quickly. Um, on the other hand, we have dynamical mean field theory, which is an approach that is exact in infinite dimensions. Uh, and then you see here that uh, there seems to be kind of a gap in our toolbox uh, at the intermediate dimensions, which means uh, more like 2D in this case. And uh, what I'm going to discuss here is that uh, these uh, neural quantum states that I'm going to introduce are uh, a very good candidate uh, to fill this gap. And uh, I hope that by the end of the talk, you're convinced that this is actually a reasonable approach. So uh, the uh, numerical machinery uh, 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 below this uh, is an approach where uh, is a variational approach. So the idea is that uh, as a wave function, we write down a variational form of the wave function, which means we have some function that is parameterized by parameters beta um, that uh, gives us the coefficients uh, for each basis configuration. Uh, uh, pictorially, one can imagine we have kind of this black box machine 
uh, where we feed these uh, computational basis configurations as input data, uh, and then it, it gives us uh, as an output just a complex number, and the important <laughs> feature here is that this box has this, uh, this uh, control knob that we can, where we can new tune uh, uh, these parameters theta such that this machine behaves uh, the way that we uh, want it to. And uh, more, a bit more formally, this means um, what we obtain here is a variational manifold of uh, quantum states, and then uh, any, an initial state in our dynamics is one point uh, on this uh, manifold, and uh, our objective now is to find a trajectory within this variational manifold that uh, approximates in each point as good as we can the, the true uh, Schrodinger equation. And the variational approach here means that at each point in time, uh, we write down an, uh, or we have an optimization problem uh, that we can uh, uh, sketch in a way that basically we minimize the distance between the left and the right-hand side of our uh, Schrodinger equation. And then if we, uh, if we write down this optimization problem, we find that uh, the problem of uh, finding the best solution of the Schrodinger equation in each point uh, translates into a linear equation uh, for our for the time derivative of our variational uh, parameters. So if we solve this equation in each point, then we can integrate this differential equation uh, and obtain the optimal solution in the variational manifold. Now the ingredients here are on the right hand side. We have this uh, so-called force uh, or the the driving force. Uh, this is where <laughs> the physical properties of the system enter. So this looks a bit cryptic, but you see here. Uh, we have the Hamiltonian operator, so uh, this, is, this gives us the direction of the dynamics. And on the left-hand side, uh, we have a, an object uh, that we can call the quantum metric, metric tensor. Uh, this is an object that knows about the local geometry uh, of, of this variational manifold. And if you are a statistician, you might uh, know the Fisher matrix. Uh, and uh, this matrix is the, the quantum generalization of such an object. Okay, so, so this is the uh, numerical machinery, and in the end, uh, we need to solve this equation in order to propagate our variational wave function. Um, so far, I did, did not uh, say uh, what is the content of this black box, and that can in principle be, will be anything. Um, and uh, then, um, thanks to uh, Giuseppe and uh, Matthias Troyer, uh, there is now this idea that, that we uh, can use, of course, also uh, neural networks uh, as, the, as the content of this black box. And I think that there are uh, uh, two very appealing features uh, uh, that are reasons why, we, why this is a good idea. Uh, the first is that neural networks are universal function approximators, uh, which means uh, that in, uh, in the limit of very wide or very deep networks, you can write any possible function in, function in the form of a neural network. Uh, and this is a de desirable feature for us because we want uh, to be in a situation that uh, we believe that any possible wave function can be represented by our black box. Uh, and uh, uh, practically, it means that we have a control parameter, uh, namely the network size. So as we increase the, increase the network size, the expressivity of the network uh, becomes larger, and then we should get to more and more accurate solutions, which gives us uh, the possibility uh, for, for uh, self-consistent uh, uh, convergence checks within this method. This is very similar to tensor networks where you crank up the bond dimension uh, and check for uh, convergence if you're familiar with that. So in that sense, this is a numerically exact approach. In principle, we can always get uh, to an exact solution. And the second point is that uh, this algorithm uh, together with, with the structure of neural networks is very well suited uh, for, uh, for exploitation of uh, uh, many no GPU clusters. So we can really exploit uh, to today's uh, supercomputing resources. Um, now, in the following, I'm not going to say a lot about the specific networks uh, that we are using, uh, because in principle, you can use any kind of uh, network architecture. I think there are two important design principles. One thing that we learned in the past years is that it's always beneficial to include explicitly all possible physical symmetries that we know, such uh, to basically to, to write down these network ansatz uh, in a form where it's explicitly symmetric under the uh, symmetries. 
Um, one example of these are convolutional neural networks where you explicitly build in the translational symmetry that your physical system might have. Uh, and the other thing uh, that is very interesting is uh, to include uh, this autoregressive property, which means that, um, uh, that uh, you can uh, basically, so we, I'm going to discuss next, this, uh, we need a Monte Carlo sampling of our wave function. And if you have the autoregressive property, then you can uh, generate basically in one shot uncorrelated samples uh, from the wave function, uh, and you do not need to worry about the autocorrelation time of a, Monte a Markov chain, Monte Carlo chain. One example for these are, these are recurrent neural networks. So uh, now you might uh, think we have our, um, our time-dependent variation of principle. We have uh, chosen an ansatz, uh, so all is good, uh, and, uh, and, it, and it simply flies. Uh, but then uh, it turns out that uh, the devil is a bit in the detail. Um, and uh, one thing that I also already mentioned is that basically to compute uh, here this matrix and this vector, uh, we need to sample the bond distribution that is given by our wave function. Uh, the reason for that is that um, uh, these, exp uh, or these, these sandwiches that we need to compute here can always be re rewritten in the form that you have uh, some function, uh, and here you have to believe me that this is, uh, can be evaluated efficiently, uh, and then in front, uh, a probability distribution that is uh, the Born distribution, uh, and uh, our problem that remains is that we need to uh, sum exponentially many terms in this sum, uh, but then this is a typical problem in physics, uh, and we know that one approach there is to do uh, to do uh, a Monte Carlo sampling of this probability distribution, and this is what we do here to estimate uh, these quantities. But this means that we just have a noisy estimate of this uh, equation, um, and then uh, one issue that we are facing is that this uh, quantum uh, metric tensor is typically severely ill-conditioned because we have so many parameters in, in, in our neural networks. So we need to invert an, a very ill-conditioned matrix uh, of which we only have a noisy estimate. So, and you can imagine that this is uh, uh, a bit of a problem. And then even more, we are looking at these time-dependent problems, um, uh, which means that the properties of all this change as a function of time. Uh, and that means that we need uh, adaptive tr uh, strategies uh, for reg regularization. And here I want to uh, highlight uh, one point where we, where we at least uh, were able to alleviate these problems a bit. Um, and this is this issue of, uh, of noise. Um, and here we looked at uh, this uh, TDPP equation and we uh, translated it first of all into the eigenbasis of our matrix. So what you see here is uh, as a function of time in, in some simulation, uh, all the individual eigenvalues of this S matrix, okay. And you can see that, uh, that uh, the noise is basically uh, independent of where in the spectrum we are. And uh, this means that it seems that the noise is sitting on the other side of the equation. And when we look at this F vector in, uh, in, in the eigenbasis, at one point in time, we have here the indices of this vector and here the signal to noise ratio of the entries of the vector. And then you see that here we do have structure and there is actually no, uh, a signal only in a few modes that are that correspond to large eigenvalues and the rest is mostly noise. And this gives us a natural uh, way to truncate or to basically to get rid of noise. So here we can specifically eliminate, eliminate the noisy contributions. And for our work that turned out to be crucial to, to uh, choose this approach uh, to get uh, rid of this Monte Carlo noise. Okay, so since uh, I'm uh, approaching uh, quickly in time, uh, I'm, I'm uh, progressing in time. Let me just uh, say briefly, this can be highly par parallelized. So uh, we benefit really from large computers uh, in the two uh, different ways. So uh, multi-node parallelization and uh, GPU parallelization. And uh, then I can get to the result. Just as a brief uh, reminder, um, we are looking at this quantum magnet and we are tuning it dynamically across the critical uh, point. And uh, here I also want to say just very uh, briefly, we can also look at static properties of these systems. Here we looked at the, uh, the gap uh, and one important uh, uh, information that we extracted from here is that actually in this finite uh, systems and finite uh, time that, that we are looking at, um, these critical exponents for practical purposes deviate a bit from the exact known exp exponents for the large systems that are known from um, quantum Monte Carlo. 
And what I'm showing here is now uh, the result when we uh, ramp the system to or a bit across the critical point. And the quantity that I'm plotting is uh, the excitation energy density. It's plotted in such a rescaled way that uh, according to our scaling hypothesis and what you see here, there are kind of these two groups of data that nicely collapse towards uh, the left end. Um, and um, th this is uh, the expected behavior consistent with uh, this uh, scaling hypothesis. Um, uh, what we are using here is this fitted exponent that we extracted, so uh, that is important in these finite time ramps that we are looking at. And moreover, you see that there are many different data, and I want to emphasize that what you, these, uh, what you see down here is actually from a tensor network approach for two-dimensional systems. Uh, and uh, the data points up here are from this neural network approach. And uh, what you see from this that is that um, this neural network data was really crucial to identify this expected uh, power law behavior. Uh, and the reason for that is that we could go to quite a kind of a, a bit larger system size up to 20 by 20 uh, spins, whereas here we have data with the tensor network approach up to 12 by 12. We can also look into a bit more detail. Um, uh, here I'm plotting the, uh, the correlation function, uh, so a spin-spin correlation function that has also the spatial coordinate, uh, again, rescaled in an appropriate manner and at different points in time, we again see a very nice uh, collapse uh, that is consistent with this finite size uh, scaling hypothesis. And uh, then you might remember that uh, we had this experimental data, or well, the people in Harvard have this experimental data, and they were interested in the same question. So they also rescaled their data uh, in a similar way. Uh, and then you can see this uh, nice collapse. So what we have in summary on this slide is on the one hand, uh, a numerical test of the, this uh, scaling hypothesis in a two-dimensional many-body quantum system, and on the other side, uh, an experimental test. Um, just as a brief outlook, um, when you look into the details and you realize that actually uh, there are uh, kind of more complications in these systems, there are long range interactions, there's spatial dependence on the uh, fields, and we are now working on including all of these experimentalists choose weird protocols when they uh, do such uh, experiments, so we include also that. And then um, our goal is of course to provide a benchmark for these, uh, these quantum simulators that are uh, being developed today uh, on this numerical basis. And uh, here, this is kind of a preliminary result where uh, we are testing the experimental observation, which are these, these dotted lines uh, with our numerical simulation. We have good agreement at short times and at long times, and there's kind of this regime of uh, disagreement at intermediate times, uh, which is probably experimental in imperfection. And for the neural network fans, uh, what we're using here is uh, a neural networks where we added also uh, block angles as an additional ingredient, uh, which turned out to be uh, crucial. So this is such an autoregressive uh, network that we chose here. Okay, so to summarize, uh, I hope that I could convince you that uh, neuro these neural quantum states are our means to, to push the capabilities of our uh, numerical uh, simulations for non-equilibrium quantum matter. Uh, and uh, as an application, I discussed uh, this, uh, this issue of dynamical universality, uh, which hasn't been studied before in these two-dimensional systems, and here we could confirm that the scaling hypothesis holds. Uh, I want to thank uh, once more my collaborators um, and also the funding uh, for at least my contributions here. Uh, and it, very important to us is uh, the supercomputing center because we really rely on these large computers. And then finally, also thank you for your attention. Uh, so maybe we have time for uh, uh, one question from, from the audience. Uh, the, the kind of tensor networks that I've seen in the past somewhat resemble neural networks. So what is it? particularly about this neural network that you think separates it from the original tensor, tensor trees and tensor networks? Yes, yeah, so I think in one way you can kind of uh, think about the neural networks as a nonlinear extension of that. Because, so the, the tensor networks are always, always multilinear func functions. Um, there are some ideas to, uh, kind of there are statements that you can basically express any uh, tensor network as an, in, in, in a sense, as a neural network. Uh, but I think 
yeah, the, the thing that is added by the tensor networks, uh, by the neural networks is nonlinearity. And the other thing is that you are not bound to this local connectivity. And so the neural network, you always like, let me maybe go back uh, here. So you see here, what they do is they, for the, to simulate the two dimensional system, they have to choose a one dimensional ordering of the lattice sites. Uh, and in these tensor networks, they are restricted kind of uh, how much correlations you can mediate along this ordering of your degrees of freedom. Uh, and this means, for example, here you have two nearest neighboring lattice sites, um, but along the path of this MPS, they are actually far away. So here you, you're generated long distance, effectively long distance correlations that you need to encode, uh, which is not a problem for the neural network, which has kind of arbitrary connectivity. And this is why we believe that this is useful in two dimensions. Uh, would it be possible to add nonlinearities into the tensor networks? Yeah, I think then you get something that looks like an RNN if you do it in the right way. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe one more question if, if there's still some in the audience. Can you tell us more about this experiment? <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, in what Which sense? <laughs> the unpublished stuff. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, well, I mean, as usual, right? So you, you head out, and then uh, you, you just uh, throw what you have on this problem. It doesn't work, and then you need to come up with solutions. Um, one thing, OK, let me say one thing maybe here. So in this protocol, this is a very slow protocol, so they are actually generating a strongly ordered state down here. And uh, these are kind of hard for the neural network in a sense. Uh, these are states that have, so if you imagine, they, say, let's talk about ferromagnet, they consist only of all spins up and all spins down. Uh, and all other coefficients are exactly zero. And you can imagine that this is hard to encode in a feed-forward neural network uh, to give exactly zeros for almost anything except for the perfectly ordered states. Uh, and uh, it's also hard to sample. Uh, so uh, this is why we came up uh, with this. Well, it's, it's not our idea to use neural network, uh, uh, recurrent neural networks. But I think for this reason, it's, it's a good idea to use recurrent neural networks in this setting. Yeah. Brilliant. I was hoping that somebody would ask about the extended kibble Jurek mechanism that you've oh, introduced, yeah, but they yeah. will have chance to do it in the yes, in yeah, the I'm break. Happy to discuss in that, the yeah. meantime, <laughs> let's thank Marcus again for the very nice talk.